So my topic is Islamic reform. And before I start, I just want to mention that in the past few years, I have led a war against Islamic reform. And I have managed to convince a lot of people within the Muslim community that used to back Islamic reform to now abandon it. And the reason why I think this is not just something that is wrong, but something that is extremely dangerous and need to be fought against is because I think the Enlightenment values in, Western, in North American and West European countries are under threat by some of the most anti-enlightenment ideas, which are Islamic ideas, but in, West, in these countries, they are mostly, the reform argument is used as a way to shield the toxicity of how dangerous these values are, how Islamic values are. And because, in, unlike in Islamic countries, the reform, Islamic reform argument is used as PR for Islam, that's what, and, and how, how unique and sensitive it is to preserve enlightenment values in these countries. That's why I'm focusing a lot on showing people how big of a mistake it is to support any form of Islamic reform. Before I go through the arguments people have for Islamic reform and destroy them one by one, uh, let me just give you some context of what, why I'm, where I'm coming from. I grew up in Iran in a very liberal family. Uh, that didn't take Islam seriously at all. But I could not understand how could people could consider themselves Muslim and not take Islam seriously. As soon as I figured out that hell was an option, I realized that any sane human being would focus their entire time and energy and thoughts to avoid going to hell. Nothing else could be a higher priority than that. And the fact that, and this was me as a kid, not, not understanding how could people around me believe in hell and worry about uh, buying, the, buying a car or their grades or their part, what to wear in the next party or whether the curtains match the, uh, you know, the, the car. <laughs> but at the, I, I couldn't understand how could anybody think about anything else other than avoiding inter eternal torture. And I remember actually lighting a match and putting it on my skin just to see how much it hurts uh, to burn in hell. And then I tried to imagine that for thousands of years. And like, there's no way that anybody could tolerate it. So what I, when, I re when I realized a loophole, I took advantage of it. Because another thing, it, told us in Iran, and I understand a lot of Muslims don't believe in this, but this is what we were told in, in Iran, in our school, that children are pure. Unlike in Christianity, where you're born with sin, in Islam, you're pure, you're sinless when you're born, you're masoom. And you can't sin until you hit the age of reason. So, and they told us those ages for boys are 15, and for girls, that's nine. So, based on that, if I, whatever I do before age 15, it's not a sin. There's no sin before age 15. I, I just realized that they told us suicide is a sin in Islam. Suicide is a sin. But they also told us there's no sin before age 15. So if I kill myself before age 15, I die without sin. And I can't go to hell if I have no sin. So there's only one place for me to go, that's heaven. I asked my religious teacher, why wouldn't I just kill myself to make sure I don't go to hell? And they to he told me that, well, because if you earn heaven, you go to a higher part of heaven. Like apparently heaven has different layers. The highest part is for martyrs, that's where Muhammad is. But the lowest part is for people that died just because they died as children. I said, I don't give a fuck which part of heaven I go. I just don't want to go to hell. I'll take a parking lot for eternity as long as I make sure that I don't take any burning. So I jumped out of the window from my school. I bo broke both of my legs. My left arm, I fractured my back, I was in a wheelchair on my bed for seven months. And the only reason why I didn't try again was because I saw what it did to my parents. I saw my dad cry for the first time, I saw my mom just collapse on the ground in the hospital. So I felt like, what did I, sh yeah, I should have thought about them as well. So I didn't try it. But there's a lot of stories after that, but the point of, the reason why I bring up this story is because even to this day, I think my logic was sound. I think given the premises that I was given, 
my conclusion was correct. My logic is still solid. Did, I couldn't understand why more people weren't taking advantage of this loophole. Like, why would you gamble potentially going to hell? Everybody, I found a get, get out of jail free card, I found a loophole in the system and I took it. And that was a rational thing to do. But the irrationality was not the logic, was the premises, right? So, my argument is when you have false premises, when you're dealing with false premises, even with sound logic, you, you end up with false conclusions. And false conclusions lead to dangerous behavior, right? The idea of Islamic reform is suggesting we keep the false premises, but maybe we could lead people to different conclusions. No, when you have false premises, when you're dealing with shitty nonsense, with, with fiction, when you're dealing with fairy tales, the only way to get to good conclusion is by promoting false logic. Are we on the side of promoting false logic? Are you going to lie to people? Where, what happened to intellectual honesty? We're atheists. We don't believe in bullshit. Are you going to tell people that this verse... Are we as atheists that were against religion and now trying to promote a different religion to replace one lie with another lie just because it's not harmful to us? Are we actually actively thinking that we are going to go lie to people? Do we think that we are smart enough, we are good enough for atheism, but these lower people, these masses, like, no, let me, let's just give them some bullshit, as long as they're not hurting us. How, how selfish do we have to be to not give people the option to believe in the truth. Anyways, the, the main thing that people, the number one argument that people have against me when they say like, I mean, listen, there's 1.8 billion Muslims in the world. Do you really think that they're all gonna leave Islam tomorrow and become atheists? And I tell them, do you really think that tomorrow they're all gonna become reformists? The argument is not about, it's not all or none thing. The argument is which one method works better. Neither, all of them are not going to leave Islam, all of them are not going to become reformists, but my method works, your method doesn't. I have the numbers to back it up. What do you have to show? You have nothing. You're telling people that, hey, this verse that tells you that, hey, you can beat your wife, it actually means you can tickle your wife. And like, what the fuck are you talking about? It says right there, you can beat your wife. I'm telling them, you're lying to them about their own scripture. It's written there in black and white. I'm telling them, hey, have you considered that maybe there is no God? That's an easier argument. By the way, even if you succeed with that one verse, now you have to repeat that with another thousand verses and another thousand hadiths. Good luck with that. I have to just ask one question. What if there is no God? And I don't even have to convince them that there is no God. I just have to give them some small seed of doubt. Small seed of doubt, that's all I need. That's all I need to make them focus on this life rather than the next one. Hey. Another thing, another thing regarding this 1.8 billion Muslims is that the war that we're fighting against Islam is not a war between non-Muslims and Muslims. The war that we're fighting is within every individual. Okay? When we're fighting Islam, we're fighting Islam within the mind of a Muslim. So, but people think like, but Muslims this, but Muslims that. As if Muslims are just Muslim and nothing but Muslims. Muslims are influenced by many things, many, many things. One of them is Islam. When you're fighting Islam within one individual, even if they don't leave Islam, you're reducing the influence of Islam in that one individual. A Muslim is just like the rest of us, and a Muslim is influenced by Islam, by the podcast, by other things, by the podcasts they listen to, by the books that they read, by the YouTube channels that they watch, by their parents, by their friends in school, by their teachers. The way, when we are competing with, against Islam with better values, <laughs> that is, <laughs> with beer, maybe we find Islam with beer, what we're doing is, the, the, the influence of Islam on every Muslim is always a negative one, it's always a toxic one. There is no positive thing about the influence of Islam on an individual. But what we're doing within an in individual, when we f defeat Islam, is we're making the effect of Islam on that one individual less compared to other sources of influence. Some people ask me, I mean, why can't we, what's wrong with making Islam more progressive? What's wrong with making Islam more, um, you know, LGBT friendly, women rights friendly? Why can't we make, why can't we have another version of Islam that is more 
um, compatible with enlightenment values. What's wrong with that? And like, how are you going to do that? The, 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 way, the place that you've had an influence was when you could have introduced a bullshit filter to the to individuals. If you don't have that filter, if you don't teach people how to recognize what's true and what's not true, after they pass that, after they already fail to recognize to recognize what's bullshit, what filter are you going to introduce to them to land on enlightenment values? When they pass that barrier, when they didn't have a filter to recognize what's true, where they land is not really that much in your control anymore. They can land anywhere. It's random. If there, are most, if there are many of them that are good people and peaceful, that's not because of Islam, that's because them, they are good people. The only place that you could have had an influence was that logic filter, was giving people critical thinking, critical thinking skills to realize that the Prophet cannot cut a moon in half and go to heaven on a, on a horse or whatever that thing was. <laughs> but and one example that I give to people is imagine that uh, you sh some guy shows up in a bar, actually I have two examples, so bear with me, and finds a napkin, and the napkin says, kill people that don't believe in this napkin. And then you go behead me, and I'm like, what are you doing? Like, I, I, I'm following napkin religion, like, are you serious? Like, oh, you're a boss, I'm going to kill you, okay? And I'm like, okay, well, that's, that's, that's nonsense, that's horrible. But then let's say somebody comes and picks up that napkin, and says, like, no, you misunderstood this napkin. He says, kill, it means kill them with love and, and passion. It's not about beheading people. And then you go around and you, you're saying like, you know what, I like this second guy. I like people looking at napkins in the bar and trying to read positive messages out of them and follow napkins in a positive way. And like, you're, you're endorsing following random napkins in a bar. Do you realize you're, you're giving an argument? You, are you not asking him, are you, is the question not here not, why are you listening to napkins with writings on them on the bar? Is that not the main question that you should be asking here? People, people say like, listen, if we lie to people, we could get short-term benefits. If we tell people, yeah, maybe in the long run. In the long run, people, we could educate people, we could give them critical thinking skills, and they will become atheists and whatever. But in the short term, if you tell people that, hey, that Islam is woman friendly, Islam is science friendly, Islam is LGBT friendly, we could, you know, we could get short term gains. You know, you do your thing, they, they do their thing. The example I give for that is imagine a doctor shows up at this village and sees that there's a disease in this village that everybody is infected by. And she decides that she wants to come up with a medicine that cures this disease, and she figures it out. But she needs to sell it so she could get more money so that she makes more medicine. But, sorry. But the people in the village don't believe her and they don't buy her medicine. So she comes up with a story and she says that, listen, on my way here, there was a fairy in the forest. And the fairy in the forest told me that to give you this potion, not medicine, this potion. And as soon as she comes up with the stories, people are lining up and buying her medicine, right? So she tells, and people buy her medicine and she cures the disease and then she leaves and everybody is cured and like, well good, she lied to them, but it worked, it was, a, it was a good lie, it was a white lie. But the problem is, once she leaves, other people show up and they're like, you know what? I didn't, the fairies talked to me as well and now they're selling water. They're selling water but they're making money out of it. And now some other guy comes and actually sells drug and like, you know what? The, fairy, the uh, forest, uh, forest fairies also told me that, to, that this, they gave me this. And now people are becoming addicted, and now they're selling poison to people. The thing is that, yeah, if, if you had spent the time to educate people to why this medicine actually works, you might have gotten less short-term results. But because you didn't spread lies, you, did, you weren't responsible for creating, for endorsing, believing in nonsense, you didn't build the groundwork for other people to come misuse people's misinformation. The long-term benefits of fighting for the truth is always higher than the short-term benefit of spreading lies. <laughs> Another thing people say is that, you know, what, but why would we throw out the baby out with bathwater? Like, there are good messages in Islam. There are some things that we could keep. Let's get rid of the bad and keep the good. I say those good things, the so-called good things in the Quran are actually what makes the Quran more dangerous. They are the PR front of the to toxic. They are the reason these, these religions still last. These, these vague 
verses in the Quran where you could read in different ways, that gives the, the religion the flexibility to whenever it feels threatened to go on defensive mode and act like cute and cuddly. And as soon as it, also, as soon as it gets the opportunity to come back, it becomes aggressive again and bites you in the ass. But you have to, you have to realize that these, these warm and fuzzy messages in, 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 the, in scripture are actually what makes it more dangerous and what makes it more toxic, not less. They, they tell me, many, like, how could you think that Islamic reform doesn't work? Look, there's so many Muslims that are supporting secularism. I know my Muslim friends that show up and get, you know, LGBT, get gay pride parade. Uh, there are Muslims that are fighting with me for secularism. And I say, okay, well, I also know a lot of Muslims that are vegan. Does that make veganism Islamic? I know a lot of Muslims that love Game of Thrones. Does that make loving Game of Thrones Islamic? What about knitting? There are many Muslims that do knitting. Does that make knitting Islamic? Muslim, again, Muslims, uh, the Muslims that do all these things, they are doing these things not because of Islam. They're doing it in spite of Islam. These people, these are Muslims that are better than Islam. Islam will always be anti-woman. Islam will always be anti-LGBT. Islam will always be anti-secularism. Islam will always be anti-human, anti-science, anti-skepticism. Islam needs to die. There, there is any other set of ideologies, any other book, any other doctrine that endorsed slavery, wife beating, torturing people that don't believe in it, killing groups of people, any other set of ideologies that promoted a fraction of the problematic teachings of the Quran would have not survived, that people would not be making excuses for it unless it was being labeled a religion. It's the religion label that makes people make excuses for the shittiest ideas on this planet. Another thing is that what reformists do is that they look at all these peaceful Muslims and they say like, look, there's so many of them and that's because of Islamic reform. Because of Islamic reform. But what is Islamic reform? Islamic reform is looking at Quranic verses and trying to come up with a different interpretation. But most Muslims they don't read the Quran, they don't read the Hadith. These are not these are nominal Muslims. These are not people that read the Quran and decided to come up intellectually come up with a different interpretation and not live Islam, Islamic life. Most Muslims are mostly considered about mostly thinking about living their lives. And the fact that they're living peaceful lives is not because they they're following a reformed version of Islam, it's because they're ignoring Islam. The reformists the reformists are a, such a fringe group of people that they're even more fringe than the jihadists that people always want to point out how low they are. We, without, without the support, without, with a fraction of the attention that the reformists have gotten, they look at the ex-Muslim movement, we have grown hundreds of thousands of people in the past few years, and people keep like, oh yeah, Islamic reform, but the fuck, look over here. Look what we're doing, without, even, without any of your support. I actually we get back to that, why we don't get any of the support. They tell us some people need Islam. Some people need it. Some people, some people could, are not mature enough, you know, it just gives them hope. There are, nobody needs false beliefs. Everybody is better off believing in the truth. That's absolute nonsense. We wouldn't say that about any other false belief. We wouldn't say, some people be need to believe vaccine cause autism. It's just, it's just what they need. They're, they're not these dangerous ideas. We will go attack, we attack them, and we, we attack all false beliefs, but we need to attack Islamic false beliefs even more, given that how many people have been convinced that set, this set of false beliefs, maybe we shouldn't attack them. When people think that, you have to double down on attacking it. A lot of people say, by the way, I'm, trying, I'm shortening it. There's a lot more I have to say, but I don't want to go on for too long. A lot of people say, well, what about Christianity? Christianity was reformed. Why, if Christianity was reformed, why can't Islam reform? I tell you, Christianity was never reformed. Christians were reformed. Christians were reformed by taking Christianity that seriously. Muslims can also reform by taking Islam that seriously. It wasn't the reformation movement that took, put Islam in the back seat. 
if the, Re the Protestant were as violent and as superstitious and sometimes even more so anti-woman and anti-Semit, and, you know, the, everything that, the, that was wrong with Catholics was also wrong with the Protestants. The Reformation is not responsible for any progress. It is not responsible for putting Christian where it belongs, which is nowhere. But it was the Enlightenment movement which was an which was a fight against Christianity. It was the Enlightenment movement that made Christian countries more advanced. What we want for Islam is not a reformation movement. We want another Enlightenment movement in the Islamic world. We don't want another Martin Luther. We want more of Voltaire. In fact, if you look at what the Reformation movement was for Christianity, what was the message? The message is that you don't need the priest, you need to go directly to the, to the Bible itself, you need to go to the text, it's by faith and faith alone. That was the main core message. We already had a Reformation movement like that in Islam, it's called Wahhabism. Telling Muslims that they need to follow the Quran more directly. Yeah, that's 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 not a good idea. <laughs> Some people say reform. You know, I mean, you're actually wrong. Reform works. There are some people that reform works on. Like maybe you do your atheism, but reform works for some people. Let's just keep it. Why can't you just let reformers do their thing? And you do your thing. Let the reformers do their thing. Right? I tell you that. Reform is a reaction to our fight against Islam. It's not, de-Islamization doesn't come as a result of reform. Reform comes as a reaction to de-Islamization. It's a defense mechanism. We take charge against Islam, and Islam, as a defense mechanism for it to remain relevant, uses reform. But the thing is that we already have are winning the de-Islamization. We don't need to give the excuse for them to stay around. That reaction is not necessary. We don't want to give excuses for Islam to live longer. We want Islam to die. <laughs> I actually, Sam, I actually uh, debated this with Sam Harris on, on the Secular Journalist podcast. And Sam Harris told me on the podcast, he said, look, if you can make Islam 10% better, that's progress. And unfortunately, Ali Rizmi didn't let me continue because I was talking about reform that much, but this is what I wanted to say to him right after. Um, but but, but fair, to be fair to Ali Rizmi, it was because I was talking about reform all show, so. But I would say, yeah, but that 10% improvement is not because of the reformists. It's because of people like us that are fighting against Islam. That's a reaction to us. Not the reaction to the reformists. People, there has never been a religion or any form of authority that just looked within and decided like, maybe we need to adopt to the modern. No, they were forced. They were forced by better ideas. Christianity was forced by better competing ideas to adopt. Islam will never, ref there's nothing in Islam in itself that will make Islam reform. Even if you look at the leaders of the reform movement in Islam, look at their journey, why they were, they were radicals, and now say, well, oh, we're not radical anymore, so reform could work. Look at their journey, it was never because they read the Quran one last time, or read the Hadith one last time, and decided like, oh, the message is actually, I, it was, I was programming all along, I just was reading it wrong. No, it was other people, it was competing ideas, it was anti-Islamic messages, and they, want, they were convinced that the values in Islam is wrong, and they wanted an excuse to keep their Islam. But when they were convinced that the values in Islam is wrong, they were already, we have already won. We have already won them over. They would not go back to accepting those values. Why do we need to give them the comfort to keep their Islam? Why do we owe them that? We don't owe them that. Why, why? Because if we give them that, they will use it to keep the shitty ideas alive. Because they might read it differently, but other people that can read black and white, they can see that, no, these people that take Islam seriously will follow it by the book. And these are always with it. As long as Islam, as long as Islam has anything to do with the Quran, it will always be against humanity. Well, why can't we change the definition of Islam? Why does it have to be so tied to the Quran? 
And like, okay, okay, let's do your solution. Let's redefine it now. This is as if somebody says, like, you know, I have, the, I found the cure for cancer. I found how to fix cancer. Let's redefine cancer. And now, if I redefine cancer to something good, now cancer is not bad anymore. Well, if you redefine cancer, we still have that ca original cancer to deal with, and now people think cancer is not bad anymore because you're confusing them with definitions. If you redefine Islam, you have Islam 2.0 now. You didn't fix the problems with the, that shitty book. I don't know what you're going to call that, but some, a lot of people believe in the Quran, and that's still a problem. And now, because you're using Islam for something that is not problematic, you're using the branding of Islam to provide cover for a lot of shitty ideas. Does that make sense? Yes. <laughs> one, one other reason why I tell people reform doesn't work is because the reform narrative is not meant for Muslims. The na reform narrative is meant for you guys, right? Yeah. Muslims do not take reform seriously because, and let me tell you how ridiculous this reform is to, to Muslims, right? The, every single verse in the Quran, every single dot, every single hadith has been written about and discussed for 1400 years by Shia and Sunni scholars. There are, they have books upon books and walls filled with texts explaining every single detail and the context and the tafsir and commentary over commentary about the commentaries, right? But, it, and then you have these reformers coming in like, hey, have you considered that this verse that, that, that means that it's clearly saying this, it actually means something else, but Muslims are like, are you fucking serious? Like, who the fuck are you? Have you, do, have you not seen how much we've talked about this? And they, the, the, the example that I give, that imagine that you have some Harry, Harry Potter fan fictions, right? And they are writing fan fiction, and they are trying to decide, there's a spell that somebody's casting, a wizard is casting a spell, and the other, the other people are arguing that this doesn't make sense, because this wand doesn't have tear dragons in it, and there's no way to cast that spell without tear dragons in it. So these are people that are really hardcore Harry Potter fans, and they understand the internal rules within this world. Even though the world is not real, there's some internal structure to it, but there's some internal logic to it, even though it's all fantasy. But imagine if somebody just joins this club and says, and my wizard pulled out a lightsaber. People are like, what? Get the fuck out of here. Like, you clearly don't understand the rules within our universe, right? So, what the reformists are to the Islamic world is a lightsaber in a Harry Potter world. People they don't take them seriously. They clearly say, like, you guys are completely off. You have no idea what we're talking about. And a lot of Muslims don't understand that these people are not even talking to them. This is why the mo number one fans of Islamic reformists are not Muslim. There are Westerners that want to be like, oh yeah, we have hope for Islam. It could be Nabi You are the audience. You are the ones that are being fooled. Majid Nawaz once told me on the same podcast on Secular Jihadi, and uh, I told him that you know these verses clearly mean this and that. And he told me that, and this is another argument that people have, like, Armin, you sound like a Wahhabi. Like, if you, if you say these verses mean this, if you say these verses mean killing non-Muslims, then these verses mean that we're going with you. You're basically agreeing with the fundamentalists. You're agreeing with the fundamentalists, and you're pushing their narrative. You're pushing the Wahhabi narrative. And, you know, I, I like Majid as a friend, but he's, I, this is nonsense, okay? Because, sorry Majid if you're watching this. But, um, yeah, the reason why it's nonsense is because it's like, if you go to somebody and say, like, they read my Kampf, and you're like, yeah, this is very anti-Jewish and racist and very, yes, yeah, it's very anti-Jewish, right? So you, you can tell them like, wait, so you think Mein Kampf is anti-Jewish? So you agree with the Nazis that Mein Kampf is anti-Jewish? So you're agreeing with the Nazis. The main difference is that we think that it's not okay to be anti-Jewish and they think it's a good thing. The fact that we read the same text and we can clearly say what it says, that, that similarity is not as important as the fact that Wahhabis think that it's it's okay to beat your wife, and we think it's horrible. That's the difference that uh, that's the difference that you should be focusing on, not the fact that we, we both drink water. We both that uh, that's that's very nonsense, right? 
the, the last thing that, no, actually two more things. Oh, two more things. A lot of people say like, you know, I'm in baby steps, okay? Yeah, fine. Atheism, anti-religion, doubt, but reform could be a gateway to atheism. It could be a step, you know, some people are not comfortable, they're not ready for atheism. This could be a step in between. I tell them, if you want baby steps, you don't need to lie to people. Doubt, as I mentioned, is a baby step. I don't, you, I'm not saying that we should only accept atheism and anything other than atheism is not acceptable. The seed of doubt, just a time, nobody is going to dedicate their life entirely to something that they're only 99% sure about. Okay? The, the difference between promoting doubt and skepticism rather than actively lying to people about what's in their scripture is one of them is intellectually honest and the other one is not. One of them is providing cover for Islam and the other one is not. The last thing. The last thing is people tell me that I mean this is what you're trying to do is unrealistic and you're being hateful. And I don't understand what you know, you're being very anti Islamic and this is not being tolerant of other people's views and things, right? And it's unrealistic. You can't you can't uh, make people leave Islam. First of all, we have thousands, thousands of people we have made leave Islam. We are responsible for it. And these are only the people that we know of. As the people, other people mentioned here, there are astronomically higher numbers that they can't even mention that they have left Islam. And you, another thing you better really say is that you know you're even if you are not against Muslim, yeah, you say you're you're against Islam. You don't you're not against Muslim. You're against Islam. Fine, fine, fine. But what you're saying is giving narratives to the bigots, to the people that actually hate the Muslims. The things that you're saying is fueling their narratives. I say okay, okay, fine. So you know what else helped the far right, the Nazis. You know what the Nazis use as their narrative? Evolution, yeah. right? They use evolution as a way to push their white supremacist narrative. So, should we stop teaching evolution? Maybe instead of when people use the truth and mis misuse the truth to push their hate narratives, maybe we should fight the misuse rather than the truth. We should never back down on spreading the truth just because somebody is misusing it. Fight the misuse, not the truth. We, we can win this by, but first of all, another thing I want to point out is that we want to go on the offense. A lot of people here like, oh, Islam is coming, Islam is coming, we need to defend ourselves against Islam. I'm like, no, stop defending yourself against Islam and attack Islam. We need to go, if they're spreading their ideas to us, we need to go and spread enlightenment ideas to them. And we need to go to the source. We need to go to Islamic communities here and in Islamic countries, and we need to spread our values instead of just defending ourselves against their values. And we need to focus on the children. And I tell Muslims, we're coming for your children. And they don't like it when I say that. <laughs> and another thing is, like I mentioned in the Q&A section, we need, in, in, the, in the few countries that we still have enlightenment values, you need to, pro you need to only accept, when you, when you actually accept refugees, please make sure they're actually the refugees, and please make sure they actually accept these enlightenment values. And when you bring them here, provide them a platform to fight the, fight the, the destructive ideas here and also back home. And this is a win-win for both countries. If you accept ex-Muslims and other refugees that are promoted of enlightenment values, first of all, you're not risking your own country and also you're providing a platform for people here to attack anti-enlightenment values back home. Last one, I promise. Okay? With regards to the ex us being unrealistic and our ideas not working, we have, again, the, the reason why the reform movement gets so much support and the ex-Muslim doesn't is because what we say is not politically correct. Right. We think Islam needs to die, but these other reform people are saying that, hey, there's hope for Islam, and these governments and non-profit agencies are like, yeah, those, you know, the, you, what you're saying seems racist and stuff, so we're going to give all the funding and all the media and all everything to them. And the interesting thing is with all the attention and the resources they got, they have produced this. They have, they have shit to show for. They have nothing. 
They have no results and with no attention, no resources, the ex-Muslim community has grown exponentially here in Arab countries, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Turkey, in Iran. We have grown. You know why? Because we have the truth on our side and the truth works. The truth works. If you're on the side of the truth, eventually you will win. The Europe, Europe is betraying enlightenment values. One last thing. Europe is betraying enlightenment values, right? And we, we are fighting for it. And we are here, with or without your support, we, are, we don't want reform. We don't want a new version of Islam. We want to end Islam. Yeah. We want enlightenment. And if, if you are going to betray your enlightenment, we're not going to give up on our version of enlightenment in the Islamic world.